what do we do about this mess that we just talked about for the first hour or so? Uh, having done a lot of work on this, I really think there's, there is a structured way to go at this. So it's not just you know, being overwhelmed and flailing. And to start with, just like when we work care for a patient, uh, starting with a diagnostic workup to understand what the problem is in this organization. Burnout is everywhere. And in every organization, it's different. The organizations themselves are different. The workplaces are different. The concepts are the same. But well, how to approach it for your either organization-wide or your microcosm of the organization really depends on the situation you're dealing with, just like with a patient. You know, different patients have hypertension. They have different needs. We don't treat every single patient the same. We want to address burnout specifically so it will address the underlying problems. So start with a diagnostic workup. We'll talk about that. Then do a planning session based on that diagnostic workup to develop the interventions. Just as we assess patients, we, we want to assess and come up with a plan. And then that plan should address these three key areas of professional fulfillment. This is a model that really has been developed and, and accepted around the country, essentially around the world. That, and again, developed by the people at Stanford, uh, Dr. Tate Shanafelt and, and his team, uh, where you address three things. First of all, personal resilience. The Center for Provider Wellbeing is exactly what that's about. Uh, we want to be addressing providing people resilience. Even if practice was perfect, even if the culture was wonderful, we still deal with these deep challenges. We need that. But there's so much opportunity in efficiency of practice. And efficiency of practice, we have to be careful with how we present this if we present this to our colleagues. Because they might look at that and say, Oh, yeah. You just want me to see more patients generate more RVUs. That's what efficiency of practice means to me. It will scare people away. Efficiency of practice means eliminating those things that keep us away from spending our time deeply engaged in the activities that bring us fulfillment. We, it's, it's all about getting rid of the stuff that is a waste of time, that drives us crazy, and enabling us to be deeply engaged where we provide the best value. And, and where we find satisfaction ourselves. And then culture of wellness, this is really about developing a man, there is, culture still is a very vague term, but there are systematic ways to develop your ability to create the culture of wellness, and we'll talk about that as well. So we'll go through all of these. And we'll start with the diagnostic assessment. Burnout surveys, uh, this is and they, assessing both the manifestations and the drivers of burnout. There's the Maslow Burnout Index, which that's the gold standard, gives you those three different manifestations of burnout. It can be accompanied by a survey called the Area of Work Life Survey, which actually surveys for those six drivers of burnout that we talked about. When you put those together, you can get some directional sense of this. Um, and so it's good. There's also the Mini-Z, which is about a 12-question survey uh, that uh, was de designed by Mark Linzer out of Minneapolis, um, out of Hanum, I think it's Hanneman. Um, the, their, um, that's that's a, it's somewhat similar but different. It measures burnout slightly differently, but it's becoming recognized in many ways as a common uh, way to survey because it's relatively short. Uh, there's also, um, the Stanford has actually a professional fulfillment survey that's quite a bit longer, uh, but it, and they'll, even there, they only run it at max once a year, maybe every two years because it's, it is longer, it takes more for people to do it. And then um, some others that we've found helpful, the AMGA has a provider satisfaction survey. It's not really designed as a burnout survey, but it goes deep into the root causes of what drives satisfaction. And by being able to address those, you really can address the issues that are related to burnout. Uh, and I think those are the primary ones uh, that, that you can use. Uh, it's, it's really important to measure. The engagement surveys, which Press Ganey, you know, has this large national database of engagement. Engagement and burnout are not the same thing. I've actually taken the engagement survey, looked at all of its questions, and tried to correlate them with the Maslow burnout inventory and work-life survey questions to see where there's a connection. There are some connections, but there's also a lot of disconnect in that. So you can't assume that because engagement is good, that burnout is not an issue. Combining that with the WBI, 
could actually be very helpful because then you can find distress even when people are engaged, they may be distressed. So there's a number of ways to go at it. The most important thing is you're, you're doing some surveys because without that knowledge, without understanding what the problem really is and where the details, you know, if, or, um, especially by specialty, group by group, where the challenges are, you may not really know where you need to be addressing. So, so you want to start with that survey. You also want to understand the KPIs. How's the organization doing on its important metrics? Quality, safety, uh, access, satisfaction, financial performance. We can't do this work in a way that reduces financial performance. We, with that, if we can't keep the doors open and the lights on, it doesn't matter how happy people are, how less burned out they are, how fulfilled they are. If we don't have a place to work, if we're, not, if we're struggling, that's not going to work. So tying all this work to, the, to improving the overall organization is key. Leadership assessments. As we've talked, we've talked about already some, we're going to talk more. Leadership is crucial. Understanding how each person in a leadership position is doing. Where are they doing well? Where are their opportunities to learn and improve? And being able to coach individual leaders in that process makes a world of difference. Dealing with EPIC and the signal report. Uh, this is absolutely vital to addressing uh, burnout because we need to understand how effectively EPIC is actually deployed across the organization as well as how effectively each individual is using all of the opportunities within EPIC to actually become more efficient. There's, a, there's an awful lot there that people, as we get started working, as we dive in, we just get so busy, either we learn some trick that we've forgotten because we're just so busy it never occurred to us, or uh, there's things we never learned, and Epic continues to improve these things over time. So it's both a matter of how it's deployed organization-wide, but how well individuals take responsibility to learn the, the efficiencies that are there because there are many. And then uh, the, the last thing here, in, in terms of the diagnostic, shadowing workers and interviewing key stakeholders, actually, particularly for non-clinical people, because... We, as, as we get into administrative roles where we're not seeing patients, um, we're making decisions often in conference rooms with committees based on spreadsheets and reports, and we lose, potentially lose sight of the actual implication of the decisions that we make. And by going to the clinical site and following a doctor or a nurse through their day and seeing all the barriers and frustrations that we run into while we're trying to care for patients, uh, it can be life-changing for an administrator who's not actually seeing patients to understand, my goodness, what, it, you know, what a mess this is, um, and can really change their motivation to, to take this on in a far more aggressive way. Uh, the, and it's, I kind of just, I'll describe it as, okay, if I'm going to care for a patient, I could sit at, you know, sit at the computer, read all the data, look at all the images, and then make a decision to care for the, to treat the patient, but I haven't actually examined the patient. And walking in their shoes, going to do immersion can actually give you that experience um, of ex it's essentially examining the patient before you make decisions about how to address the problem. And then there are ways to actually get more information directly, either interviewing uh, clinicians or there's a, a, a software called WikiWisdom that'll, that helps you, helps you get information from people who otherwise might not share that with you. Uh, many of the burnout surveys, as well as the engagement survey, will have free text areas where you can actually just write things in. I've been in many institutions where engagement or burnout is down in the 10th percentile, not the 90th, and those administrators don't even want to look at that free text information because it, they just, they, they see it as so negative. They think, I don't want to, I don't want to know, which is the worst way you could think about how something might be. It's like telling the patient not to tell you about the, their most important symptom. So those are the approaches. Let's talk about how to do these both individually. Uh, designing the program should be a one or two day session similar to the effort you put into a strategic planning session. We're talking about changing the workflows, changing the culture of the organization, getting into the things that truly help you make a difference and make change. And if it's it, it, it will be more valuable in many ways than a strategic planning session because you're, you're going to, um, to truly empower your workforce. So it can't be something that's just uh, done lighthearted. It should include the CEO and the C-suite because we're asking again, 
for major change. If we don't have the C-suite endorsement, uh, then anyone who really doesn't want to participate can easily kind of put it off and, and not get engaged, as well as physician leaders, both formal and potentially informal physician leaders. And this group comes together and spends this time digesting all this information and choosing where and how to focus uh, based on all that diagnostic information, coming out with a plan specific for each of those three areas that are in uh, that drive fulfillment, and then also um, assigning a process of regular review and tracking after that session so that at, at least quarterly the group comes together to look at a high level of how progress is being made. Obviously, there's daily, weekly, and monthly uh, surveys and reviews and everything going on as well, but this, this leadership group should come together regularly to be sure that what they plan is getting implemented, the results are happening, and if they're not, they can help redirect to ensure that there's more, um, that we stay on track with the original plan. Well-being support, this is absolutely vital. Education sessions, peer support, communication, uh, getting involved in onboarding, and it's, again, we said it's, this is vitally important but not sufficient. When I first started working on this, we really had to make this point to people to help them understand that asking, you know, just asking doctors to, to deal with uh, resilience, it's like putting us in the middle of a five-way intersection and telling us not to bleed so much when the cars are coming at us from every direction, we can't get away from them. An another a CMO from ThetaCare um, described it as each day uh, we're being worn down by the death of a thousand small cuts. It's not one big thing in most cases that burn people out. It's a million little things that just wear us down. And then this is Tate Shanafelt, again, the, you know, one of the major uh, researchers in this field. Tate, by the way, is an oncologist who half the time he can't come to the burnout conferences because he's presenting at some oncology conference about some amazing uh, research he's doing there as well. I don't know where he gets his energy or why he doesn't burn out because his CV is probably 25 pages long. Uh, <clears throat> but you know, he said as well, there's an urgent need to address uh, interventions that address the drivers um, and we have to face these uh, in the practice environment, the issues that are contributing to burnout. So let's get into efficiency. Anybody feel like this little guy running on the wheel here? I, I don't have embedded video, but I, I do have in a video from this that um, he's running and running and running, and then um, he falls off. He just can't keep it up anymore. So here's the EHR. It has a huge impact on our well-being. Because we spend, you know, the studies show about two hours of administrative work for every hour of direct patient care. This is the key. If we could switch that ratio from two hours of administrative to one hour of patient care and flip it so we have two hours with our patients for every hour of administrative work, that would be life-changing in terms of our personal experience as well as our ability to actually see more patients and produce more revenue and grow the population that we serve. And even the hour they're with the patient, we're practicing distracted doctoring. Just like we tell our kids they shouldn't do distracted driving, you know, texting while they're driving along. Well, we're sitting in an exam room and we're typing away, trying to pay attention to the patient, trying to get our note done at the same time. And so we've lost concentration even there. And then the pajama time, work after work, we know that's an issue. And then because of all this, we have this decreased interaction with our colleagues. That hospitalist room where everybody's in, you know, sitting next to each other, but they're all interacting with the, with the EHR. They're not interacting with each other. So it's key that we redesign this work. And I don't know, has anyone seen this picture before? This was actually published in JAMA in 2012. And it was, came there because a pediatric patient who loved her pediatrician, who was one of those pediatricians that, uh, was a, you know, that everybody in the organization loved, she, she, to thank him, drew this picture. And we see that here's the patient sitting on the exam table, her mother reading her a book, the sister in the background holding the younger sibling, and that's where the family is. And over here is the doctor that she's thanking. And he's facing away from all of them, deeply engaged in the EHR, and for some reason, he's actually got a smile on his face. We're not still quite sure why. Um, but he saw this, 
And he was horrified. And he realized what was actually happening in the exam room. And he took it to his CEO, and they started to work on changes to make things very different than what we had turned ourselves into. Because there's few other sectors in the economy where the highest trained professional is doing production work, customer service work, and clerical work. We're highly trained knowledge workers. We have very unique skills and abilities to offer. And when we're spending our time doing something that someone else can do, it's, a, it's total waste. When we talk about waste and lean, uh, this, this is an area that has, cries out to be addressed. But we've just gradually assessed, uh, absorbed all this as things came on. When I, I worked at Geisinger from 2002 through 2005, and when I first got there, we went live with Epic two weeks after I got there. And I, multiple chronic illness patients you know, with charts this thick, data entry um, up the yin-yang, there were so many nights I literally fell asleep on the keyboard trying to get my notes done. Um, and I was excited about the EHR. I thought, this is the future. And I, I personally didn't even realize what it was doing to me uh, in terms of just distracting me from my family, distract, overworking me, getting me to the point where I'd fall asleep in the office during the day trying to take care of my patients because of the work demand. Now, that was in 2002. It was epic classic. It was rud very rudimentary. Um, uh, I know uh, Judy... Um, Gosh, what's her name? The, the CEO of Epic kept insisting, oh, no, this is exactly, my, my husband's a doctor. This is exactly what the charts are like. You know, this, there's, this is completely aligned with the way we do work. Well, you know, bullpucky was not at all. But we were trying to do our best to make it work. So I started the optimization committee for Epic at Geisinger because of that. Um, still, to this day, it's still a challenge. So what can we do? Uh, with often creating care teams both in the office and in the hospital where as, as um, we're doing our knowledge work with, with team members to support us so we can focus on what is truly important. Where we have, when we know we need to do things uh, to, you know, to help manage complex pharma, pharmacologic issues, to help manage the social determinants of health, um, to help make sure patients are roomed properly and we're not doing the data entry, we can build teams around physicians and when we do that, um, we can increase productivity. Uh, it takes time and dedicated work to implement. You can do this as lean work redesign to implement these properly. There's no one formula to do it. You have to design it for yourself. But when you do, you can improve revenue and net income, even though you may be adding some expense to the process. And you drive improvement in every other um, important metric in the organization as well. And it's funny, when we did this, when I was CEO at Sutter Gould, we introduced this, and we gave people a choice. They could keep, they had one medical assistant, but we offered them, you could have two medical assistants or even three medical assistants. We just asked for higher productivity, more patient visits per day, depending on the number of MAs you'd have. And um, most people started, they were pretty skeptical at first, but as we got into it, they realized, oh, this is better. I actually, they'd see their colleagues who had been doing it going home earlier with a smile on their face and realized maybe there's something here. But there were still the holdouts who said, nope, I, I'm happy seeing 15 patients a day, my one MA, I don't want to do more, uh, even though they were going home at night and working hard. So not everybody comes along, and it's not something you can impose, but it's something that when you work collaboratively with the people you work with, you can really make a difference. Um, some other things to optimize Epic, um, well, we talked a lot about already, about the um, PEP report. Of, if you've ever worked in Cerner, there's actually a report fairly similar for Cerner. But measuring login and usage by physicians, specific coaching based on the individual physician's needs, redesigning the user interface per specialty. This is something I hadn't really thought we would be doing. In fact, we were told we couldn't do it, uh, both by Sutter, Epic, and by um, Epic itself, that you, know, you can't really, there's certain things, constraints on this instance of Epic that we have, you can't make changes. But we actually went through and worked with Epic engineers, our local uh, Epic people, and our clinicians in Lean Team, and specialty by specialty had a focused way of observing the specialists as they worked, uh, coming back and, and hearing from them what they thought they needed, then redesigning the user interface and a number of the key functions in, in, the, um, in the navigator 
to help you get through a visit so that, that they were really specialty specific. And it took a, over a year to cover 20 specialties in that process to work through it. But as it got done, what we found was we were one medical group within Sutter Health. And Sutter Health covers all of Northern California. We were just out in the Central Valley. There's five other uh, medical foundations. And all of those, um, the specialists in them, just discovered by, we didn't even advertise we were doing it. We didn't let people know it was there. They'd somehow stumble on it, find it, found it so valuable, they all started picking it up and doing it as well. So this spread across Sutter, not because we made any effort to, sh to show it, but just because it was so much better than the way it was before that people adopted it. So there is opportunity that you may not think you even have to make changes that can make a big improvement. Never give up on improving your EHR and improving the use of it. There's always opportunity. And then large screen version of the EHR, I'm so impressed here that as much as you're having trouble with still signing on, at least you've got single sign on and you're swiping. About half of the country is still typing in passwords. I was at a HIMSS meeting. We presented our work at, that we did at Gould where we had improved the, uh, you know, the user interface and all these other things and presented it actually at a session at HIMSS. It's the Health Information Management System Society. It's a huge convention. 40,000 people, the, the exhibit hall is like five acres or something, it's crazy, you know, but we were presenting our work and I asked the audience of about 200 physicians and folks from around the country, how many people are still entering their passwords? This was probably three years ago, half the room, hands went up. I was like, talk about waste. I mean, that's, that alone is 800 to 1,000 clicks per day, just, just typing in a password. And then, of course, it changes every three months, and you'd have to decide, is it eight characters, 13, 16? Who knows? Um, should it have special characters in it or not? Um, can drive you crazy. So, I'm, so you, this is a big step. Having this is important. That, again, shows the commitment that you all have to help and make things better. So in basket, um, here's another way that you can use your staff more effectively. No call should come first to the doctor. It should all get screened through someone. Maybe you guys are doing this already as well. You have a, they're supposed to be, yeah. Yeah, you should, working with your team, you should have a nurse or medical assistant reviewing every call before it gets to the doctor. There's no reason we should be taking the first calls. Um, you can, again, develop standard work on messaging protocols. Um, there's an awful lot of folders that end up in there because at some point somebody thought it was a good idea to have this folder in the in-basket that's not needed, cleaning that up. And then centralizing refills, a lot of people are doing that and finding good success with that. We certainly did. So. Here's a number of other ways, but InBasket is its own bear to deal with in the EHR. We had a separate, we, we had value streams to improve various components of our work. We had a whole separate value stream just on the InBasket because it is such a challenge. So, um, but, but great opportunities to make things better in that process. Oftentimes there's a challenge just in EHR and IT governance. Uh, in, in, as we think we've got great ideas, how do we actually get them to get put into place? Um, so streamlining that is key. Uh, having physician builders, uh, getting people trained, and I think you're developing a cadre of folks here as well who are physician builders in Epic who can help with that. Um, and also being careful to not over-interpret regulation uh, because there are so many regulations that have come out that we think, oh, we have to do this this way, we have to do that that way. When we first introduced our team care and um, we, the compliance people, et cetera, uh, when they heard about this, that you have MAs that are actually, you know, taking history from patients. They're going in the room. They're typing into the chart. You know, oh, my God, you're not allowed to do that. There's compliance rules about this. You can't do it. We had memo wars going on for months with the compliance attorneys and with Insider and ourselves about how we were doing it. We finally just had them come down for a day and watch us do it. And they go, oh, well, that's okay. Uh, but what gets interpreted in the written word and what's actually happening can be so different that you can get caught up in this. So be really, you know, the more you can think, let's just bring the people together, let's let them see what we're actually doing, you can make a big difference with that. So that's fixing the workflow in the workplace. But let's talk about leadership. This is the Leadership Academy. We're here to learn about this because in reality, all of those other things, the Center for Wellbeing, the improvement in practice, hinges on leadership engagement. So you guys have decided you're going to be healthcare leaders. Well, congratulations, because you know what? As Peter Drucker, a famous management consultant said, healthcare 
is the most difficult, chaotic, and complex industry to manage. Anybody want to leave now? And when you think that this is hard, when you think that, you know, you, you, know, you think about business people and other businesses, this is literally the most challenging thing to do. And you're trying to lead change. And to lead change, uh, leading change is incredibly challenging as well. So uh, Peter Drucker passed away probably about uh, five years or so ago uh, and, and has taught for decades. In fact, my dad got his MBA at New York University and Peter Drucker was his master's thesis guide, um, which I didn't find out until my dad died and I had gotten into leadership. I wished I could talk to my dad about all sorts of things now. But there's another great management guru from 500 years earlier in the Italian Renaissance named <coughs> Niccolo Machiavelli. Now you may think, well, that seems like kind of a top-down uh, way to approach management if you're gonna be Machiavellian about this instead of being all you know, comforting and warm and inclusive and supportive. But his lessons are key, because <coughs> if you're going to lead, you need to know this, which I wish I knew much earlier. There's nothing more difficult to take in hand, more uncertain, more perilous, perilous to conduct, or uncertain of its success than to introduce and lead the introduction of a change to the new order of things. Why is that? Because the people who benefit from the old way, those people become your enemies. They do not want this change to happen because they're doing well with the old way. And the people who will benefit, well, they're just lukewarm in their support. Why is that? You'd think they're gonna benefit from this. Shouldn't they get excited? Well, two things. First of all, they fear what they might get from their adversaries, those people that are fighting the change. And people really don't believe that things will get better until they've actually experienced it. So as you, you, so the key, this, you have to be aware of this as you're leading change. We have to lead change. We have great opportunities. But if you take some time to think through what's going on here, being aware that there are people who will benefit from the old way, being prepared to deal with them or find ways to make them an ally instead of an enemy is absolutely vital. And the people that you know will benefit, that you could have become your supporter, it's important as well to help them understand this better. That's why we do things like pilot programs to get something started. So we don't just tell every, expect everybody to do something across the board when we get started. We try it, we make it work, and then as it's working, those people become the advocates that let others know about, um, about how it's working well and we can engage in it. But as leaders, being aware that you're dealing with this incredibly complex, challenging industry, and as you institute change, you've gotta be ready to address all of the, uh, both your potential supporters, but also your naysayers and be ready to take them on is vital. Because burnout results from management practices designed for the industrial age, top down, command and control. And in this complex, chaotic environment, we need to manage for the information age, which is a completely different way of managing, which is all about empowering and aligning the people in the organization. So just to give you a sense of why this is different and how to manage, because when, I'd get, when I first was trying to lead things, I figured, you know, I have great ideas. If I just tell everybody, if I just say all my ideas, tell people these loudly enough, often enough, eventually they'll figure out I'm right and we'll get things done. Um, and that, it, it took me a lot to figure out it doesn't work that way. Um, and same thing in medicine. If we're practicing old medicine, we create risk. If we practice old management, we're creating a risk for our organization. So just the same. Uh, with medicine, it, you know, when there's something goes wrong, it's usually a system failure, not the individual physician. In management, it's usually a system failure in the way we've designed management, not the individual manager who's the problem. Not always, but most often. Failure to follow current best practices can result in the issues. Poor communication drives medical risk and, and management risk. When patients sense a lack of empathy from the physician, that puts us at great risk. 
when we sense a lack of empathy from our leaders, we um, also put the organization at risk. And, and the organization ends up at risk. And we end up with adverse outcomes, whether it's organization or clinical. So the same approach of if we didn't improve medicine and continue to improve, we, would, uh, we, we are actually becoming dangerous. If we don't improve management and continue to improve, the organization suffers. In fact, it's all about lean leadership. And in many places I go, I'll, people, I'll say, you know what? Lean is really the key. It's, it's actually the antidote for burnout. And it will help you. And they'll look at me and say, Paul, you are nuts. Lean came in here. And lean is mean. And I'll say, you know what? You're right. Lean can be mean. It can be mean if the focus is on, uh, is on increasing productivity. Because that is not what lean is really all about. Lean is principle-based. When we do it right, it starts out being based in principles and then turns into operational improvements. And it starts with what's most important. The patient is the most important person. Without a patient, we'd have no reason for us to have our jobs. Now, what's the most important thing that happens to the most important person in the organization? The most important thing that's happening is the healing interaction that happens between everyone in the health system and the patient. Every time any of us interact with a patient, it's an opportunity to reduce some pain and suffering, relieve some anxiety and worry, do something definitive to make the patient better, educate people to be healthier. The doctors, the nurses, the technicians, the therapists, the transport people, the environmental services people, anyone who interacts with a patient has an opportunity to have a healing interaction. For myself, as a family physician for 25 years, I probably had 100,000 healing interactions in the course of my career. And then I moved up the management ladder, and eventually I became the CEO. And when I was CEO, I tried to continue practicing, but trying to do urgent care half a day a week in a town that I'd never worked in before just wasn't working out. I was afraid I was going to become one of those marginal doctors. And if I committed myself just to my CEO work, I could really help the organization. So I stopped seeing patients. I was no longer doing the most important thing for the most important person in my organization. My job as a leader, and your job as leaders, is to help the people who report to you so that they're doing their job most effectively and whatever layers there are between you and the people that are directly caring for the patients, that you're helping those people to work most effectively. So supervisors and managers, they're supporting people on the front line, directors, VPs, they're supporting those supervisors and managers, people in C-suite supporting them. That's our job is to support the people. So it's not people reporting up to us, it's us supporting those people so they can do this job most effectively. In that structure, there's oftentimes we show just one individual there. It really is ideal to have dyads or triads in each of these leadership levels. The, uh, with a, the triad in the hospital, a physician, nurse, and administrator. In a medical clinic, generally you don't need the nurses and so important because of the way the work goes done, but a physician and, and an administrator uh, who work together uh, at each of those levels so that we as physicians still can put, put as much time as possible into clinical work, get our great ideas operationalized, but do it in a way where we're aware of what the, the, the nursing challenges are, the other operational challenges are, and we're working together as teams. But it's this, it's this flip of a paradigm. It's all about respect for people. In fact, um, if people are familiar with the uh, book Crucial Conversations, Anybody heard of that book before? It's a great, if you haven't, it certainly it's a great book. And I see heads nodding around the room. This quote, respect is like air. If you take it away, it's all people think about. But when they get it, they value it incredibly. And it allows you then to make other changes. So you do this by seeing systems, not people, as the problem, going where the work is done, developing and empowering people as problem solvers. A few great uh, ways, if you want to enhance your knowledge on this, uh, this guy is, is Bob Chapman. He actually spoke at the last American Conference on Physician Health. And um, Bob is the CEO of a heavy equipment manufacturing firm. 
They make things like bottle washers for Budweiser. And he actually uh, had this insight one day, he was a traditional top-down CEO, had this insight, what would happen if I treated all of my employees with the same care and concern that I have for my close friends and family? And went back to his main office in St. Louis and worked it out with his team and they tried some things and they got it to work there. But he has a large organization. He's got uh, 80 plants in 17 countries around the world. They do about $3 billion a year in business, actually have better financial performance than Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway. And he um, realized to spread this, he used lean as his management system and culture to do that. And he's written a great book called Everybody Matters. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very good book for you to, if you want to understand approaches this, how this can work better. Um, really fantastic and inspiring. There's another uh, person that I know uh, who I think is worth listening to as well. This is Jeff Pfeffer. Uh, Jeff is a, a professor at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford who spent his career talking about uh, respecting and empowering employees and how when you treat your people well, your organization uh, performs well. When I did my MBA, I read one of his early, I had to read one of his earlier books in our HR class. And I thought, yeah, okay, this book, it's called The Human Equation, and it just says, yeah, if you treat your people well, your organization will do better. And I was so angry, I thought, this guy gets paid big money to write something so patently obvious, but it's not obvious to many people. This is his, one of his latest books, and it's the opposite of that. It's, it's called Dying for Paycheck because it describes a painful bit by bit how so many organizations do things that actually harm their employees. And then Paul O'Neill. Paul O'Neill was uh, the CEO of Alcoa. He was also Secretary of the Treasury under George Bush for a few years, and then uh, when um, George W. Bush, and when uh, the Iraq War started, he uh, no longer could work in that administration, and he left. Uh, but as CEO of Alcoa, he got up in front of the first shareholder meeting when he became CEO. And he said, we are going to focus on worker safety. That is our number one metric, not return on investment, not uh, you know, uh, plant improvement, not growth. We're going to focus on worker safety. And he gave out his home phone number, because this was before cell phones, gave out his home phone number to every uh, every worker in Alcoa across the world and said, if you have a problem that's threatening your safety and you are not getting a satisfactory response from your manager, here's my phone number, call me. And one time in the middle of the night, he got one of those calls. And he, and he immediately called the manager. And within about three days worldwide, everybody in Alcoa knew that he was serious about making sure the workers were safe. And he created the, the greatest safety record of any um, you know, heavy equipment manufacturing firm in the world as a result. He has three questions he uses to address respect. The first is, am I treated every day with dignity and respect by everyone I encounter? Not just some people or the people who work for me, but by everyone I encounter, am I treated with respect? Secondly, am I given the knowledge tools, and support I need in order to make a contribution to my organization. And he said, it's not just the contribution, but it's a contribution that also gives my life meaning. And thirdly, did anybody notice that I did it? Did I get that, that reward of a recognition? And, and th these are the rules that he's used to guide many changes. In fact, he's, he led um, in Pittsburgh, they put together a healthcare quality improvement collaborative. He led this across all of uh, the you know, Western PA. And in that, in that area, they had tremendous improvement. And he actually, as an offshoot of his work, there's a lean firm called Value Capture that started based on all of his work. And he was on the board, chair of the board of that organization for many years. He passed away within the last year as well. Lastly, from that article that you received about wellness-centered leadership that came out of Stanford, here, when we think about these issues that, that they developed around reducing burnout and improving leadership for uh, burnout, the core principles, care about people always, is foundational. 
then cultivating relationships, both with individuals and with teams, and with that, inspiring change. So as you build relationships with people, it's much easier to lead change. You'll have fewer of those enemies trying to preserve the old way and more engagement from the people who do see the potential opportunity. We can't delegate this role. In fact, Mayo also demonstrated that when they do their Mayo leadership survey, that the physician leaders, the people who reported up to them, had far lower burnout than the people, if those leaders scored well on that survey, than the leaders who did not score well. So this program is absolutely vital as we develop as leaders. But it's important you're out there being seen and heard. You can't sit in your office or you know, just do your work and just assume people are going to understand. And that's where shadowing workers, I think, like I said, Mickey called it walking in your shoes, play undercover boss, whatever it is, get out there, be seen, understand the problems. If you're attending a huddle, don't go there to give answers, go there to coach people so they can become better problem solvers. Uh, developing organizational culture, mission, vision, values. There's a process of creating a compact. And a compact, when done right, doesn't just take, oftentimes with the values, people will then add to the value statement by talking about describing a reciprocal agreement to honor each value. So focusing on quality, what does that mean? How do you live that out? Is it by closing care gaps at every single visit? Is it about honoring the exact protocols you use to avoid those C. diff infections? Um, is, it, are, is it things that are put upon the clinicians to honor those values. You know, you have to close all the care gaps at every visit. Well, that can be onerous unless it's done reciprocally where the other part of it is the organization will provide you the resources you need in order to honor that value. And while we're struggling right now to think about what are the values and how can we create clarity about how to honor them and build alignment and trust in the process, working on this actually can be a great way to build uh, connections. There's this book, uh, in fact, you see the reference here at the bottom, A New Compact, Aligning Physician Organizational Expectations uh, by Karnacki and Silverson. They're a couple actually, but they've run a consulting firm that helps people work through this process. And they've written a book specifically about it uh, that gives you the guidelines, it's actually a roadmap on how to do it. Um, sometimes it's better led by an external uh, consultant because it, it, it takes away all the personal relationship issues that um, might come up if you're working, doing transformational work like this inside your organization. But there's the process of working through this, which isn't something that's done in a half a day or a one day retreat. It's done actually where you build a core basic draft of what you think it might be as a team of leaders like this. But then you go out and share it with as many people as possible in the organization over a course of time, six to 12 months, get all that feedback, rework it, so that it incorporates as many of these ideas as possible and then represent it and have people agree, yes, boy, this addresses everything we really are thinking and it gives us knowledge we'll be able to do this. Let's work on it together. Um, can make a, a world of difference in providing that support. So, um, so another you know, approach that you can use that can uh, make a difference from this cultural standpoint. These, are, these aren't the values, these are the, go the, the outcomes, the goals that we're looking for. You know, what are the metrics that you've set to perform along quality, um, customer satisfaction, growth, and uh, productivity, and human engagement? And, um, and you all, I, I don't, have you guys talked at all about strategy deployment? Is this something that people are talking about in the organization? Um, it's basically a way to take uh, the values and the metrics and put them into a process by which you then decide what, um, what strategic initiatives you're going to approach, who's going to do them, when they'll get done, and how we measure success with it. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that here because it's, um, it's pretty high level. Uh, but continuous improvement is key. And this is about, this is really, it gets to the heart of lead. When we think that things aren't working, the workflow is not working well in our office, uh, we can have people who've done something somewhere else. You know, I could come in and tell you how to do this, how I did it at Sutter Gould Medical Foundation, so therefore this is how you should do it. Uh, actually, the way it works best and to get people engaged 
is to address these broken workflow processes. You know what's broken and eliminate your frustrations, but this has to be led by yourselves in your clinical sites. The role of a lean person is to be a mentor to guide that, that, that uh, process, not to come in and tell people what to do. You really know what's wrong. You've got great ideas. You've got to figure out how are we going to implement them in some systematic way. When we do that, we're actually doing, whether you call it lean design thinking or innovation, it's all at heart the same thing of leading change driven by the people who are dealing with the problem themselves. Uh, that process uses what's called A3 thinking. The things to be aware of is that this process is the same way that we care for patients, same way we work up a patient when we see a problem. It starts with a problem statement, which is essentially the patient's chief complaint. What is the issue that the patient has? Then we need background information. <clears throat> we, get an, we do an H&P, we do initial testing. We want to understand what really is the current state of this problem. Then we do a root cause analysis. We call it a differential diagnosis, but it's trying to understand what actually the cause of that problem is. And our target that we're trying to get to is getting that patient back to their baseline health or homeostasis, however you define it. What we see is that there's a gap between the current state and the target state. And so we identify that and, and then begin to develop solutions to address those. As we do that, we test some of those pilot programs. When you're doing a, an approach of change, you know, giving a patient a trial of a medication to see if it will make a difference. When we know it's making a difference, then that is the thing we want to do as the patient's treatment plan, and we'll continue it. And once that's done, then we follow up to see, did they actually get better? We're in, in problem solving, we're looking for cost-benefit analysis in the process. And ultimately, once we know something's worked, we've seen that happen, then we turn it into learnings that we apply, whether it's to the next problem to solve or the next patient that we're caring for. So when you get introduced to this A3, just remember, it seems like it can seem like some other management technique that's a little confusing at first, but if you think about it in the context of how you care for a patient, it actually will be um, really helpful for you. Just briefly, um, again, as you're learning lean, there's eight wastes in lean that, are, um, that people, people identify in any industry in healthcare. We've got specifics around all of these, overproduction, transportation, defect, waiting, overprocessing, motion, and inventory. The greatest waste, though, is unused human potential. And when we're spending our time or running around the clinic trying to find equipment or uh, typing stuff into the EHR, we're wasting our potential as clinicians. And this is the, the greatest waste that we want to eliminate. Ways to eliminate that? It's really redesigning the workflow. Have you guys seen the uh, diagrams like this that show every step in a process and then identify you know, what works, what doesn't, what's waste, what's necessary, what's not. Anybody seen these before? Uh, about a third, two-thirds of people. Anybody done one of these before where you've actually gone in and gone through the whole process? Great. I'm hoping that you'll all get asked to do these. And when you do, or when you ask your colleagues to do them, uh, you're going to go through, you want to, you'll develop a team that has as many different disciplines as possible involved, get a stakeholder from each discipline, and get clarity about what the problem is being addressed because we all see a different aspect of the problem. We don't really individually know the collective problem, and by bringing the team together, we can. You know, doing this remotely can be very challenging. Now we're coming back together, so maybe not as big a deal, although there's good whiteboarding software to help with this. But my question is, if we need everybody involved in the problem, should we have doctors participate? Should we have doctors participate in something like how do we best get a patient from the waiting room into the exam room really prepared for the doctor to see the patient or into the ER bay or whatever? How do we make that move? Now, we're going to ask you to spend a week, four or five days with a team, figuring out how best to move a patient from the waiting room into the exam room. What happens is, a lot of doctors will say, yeah, you know, first of all, it sounds miserable. It's not something I do, sit around with a bunch of other people, you know, the registration people and the nurses and the, you know, the IT people and some lean, you know, Yahoo uh, teaching me, you know, trying to solve this problem. Just get the darn patient in the bed. What the heck? 
And oftentimes people will say, well, I'm too important. My doc, my patients need me. My colleagues need me. How can I be gone for a week for something this simple? So I'll ask them, do you ever take a vacation? Do you ever go to a CME course? Because when you take a vacation so you can replenish yourself or you go to a CME course to make sure your knowledge is current, you're not there for your patients, you're not there for your colleagues, but you have to do that. And yet when you come back, within a half a day, if not a half an hour, all of that replenishment you got from being off is gone because things are so chaotic and you cannot implement the new knowledge that you got because things are so, there's so many barriers to being able to do that. The most important time you spend away from your practice is the time you spend improving your practice because this is what transforms organizations. When you redesign work like this, you can gain, you get rid of waste, you can gain so much in the process. Uh, and we'll talk about some examples of what we've been able to do that make it transformative. Another thing to talk about are huddles. <clears throat> and how, how many people do huddles in their offices or wherever they work? A smattering. So why don't you? For those of you who didn't raise your hands, why don't you do huddles? Time. Time. Everybody right. Knows what to do. Everybody knows what to do. And if I'm going to spend 15 minutes a huddle, I could have seen one or two more patients. Why am I wasting my time in the huddle? Absolutely right. And when we implemented huddles at first at Gould, we didn't invite the doctors. We did it with the staff. And when they started to improve, when, when we started, when we learned to do them effectively, then doctors started to see improvement happen. And they would talk to their MA and say, oh, guys, yeah, you're doing problem solving in the huddles? Hey, we've got this problem that happened yesterday. Take that to the huddle for me, would you? And so, and then that thing got better. And pretty soon, um, the doctors wouldn't be sitting back in their offices. They'd be coming a little closer to where the huddle was going on. Maybe not actually participating, but kind of standing at a counter close by. And then eventually they started participating, and then they started leading them themselves. It's important that we learn how to do it effectively. The more physicians lead the process, the better. But getting the rank and file physician engaged in it um, without it working well can be a challenge. Where do we learn huddles from? Football. You know, the, all the team members, every single different role on a, on a football team, they come together, they huddle, they plan the play, right? It, it, the quarterback just doesn't huddle with the center. They all have to work together to, to make sure everybody knows what the play is going to be, everybody's ready to deal with it in the moment. So an effective huddle, and you're absolutely right, effective is a key word here. They should be no more than 15 minutes. And if, as you're getting started, you may not get through every, all the other steps I'm going to talk about here. So what? You can't let it go longer than 15 minutes. You'll learn to do it faster. Ideally, standing up. You said everybody's sitting around. Once you sit down, your level of urgency decreases by 50%. And all of a sudden, it's let's have coffee in Danish and not let's address the problems that are here. So the more you can do them standing up, at least until you develop the right approach, is key. Start with acknowledgement and appreciation. That second, uh, third driver of burnout, insufficient reward. Somebody did something great yesterday. Thank them for it. Somebody's got something special happening in their life. Birthday, anniversary, child's birth, you know, something. Um, not everybody has to get acknowledged every day. You know, this isn't a participation award, but everybody, there's something that's happened that somebody can get meaningfully acknowledged for. Preparing for the day. Do we have the capacity to meet the demand today? Look at the schedule. Look at the census. What is our staffing? How much, what do we need for supplies? Is the equipment working? Do we know where it is? Those are the kind of things that screw up your day, but if you can start to anticipate them ahead of time, your day gets a lot less screwed up. Problem solving. What happened yesterday that drove me nuts? I was so mad about that. I was sure I was gonna, I was gonna make sure that I talked to somebody and we got this fixed so it didn't happen again. I, went to, I needed something printed out of the copier. I went to the copier, it was out of paper. You know, it took me another five minutes to do that, and I was already 45 minutes behind. Man, that pissed me off. I'm going to make sure it doesn't happen again. By the end of the day, I've still got 20 epic charts to do. I'm exhausted, and the next morning, I've forgotten all about that. And so it never gets fixed. In the moment, when it happens, if you have a huddle board, you take a note and you write a note on the huddle board about that problem, about that pebble that was in your shoe yesterday. And then the next day at the huddle, people can assign 
one or two folks to work on that and start to address that and solve that problem. You don't solve everything all at once. You pick apart little things and you gradually improve them. But by bringing them forward, so at least they're acknowledged, all those little things that drive you nuts, you can, over the long run, make transformational change. Metric performance. You know, we're committed to helping First Health. If First Health succeeds, we succeed, and vice versa. If we're succeeding, First Health succeeds. We align around what's important. And there are things we do, whether it's in our ED, in our OR, in our office, every day that drive success on those True North metrics we just talked about, on safety, on quality, on access, on productivity, on uh, patient satisfaction, and on employee engagement and satisfaction. So we can build metrics and pick you know, however many metrics you want, no more than one day a week focus on any one metric. And as you're getting started, pick only one metric. Don't try to address all five metrics right out of the gate with one every day for five days in a row because you'll, um, you'll get overwhelmed. Pick one that you have that's important that you can work on succeeding at, learn how to do this, and then gradually introduce more over time as you get better at it. By doing this over time uh, with a standard approach, you start to truly make transformational change. You learn to work together as a team, you're addressing the key things that drive you crazy, and you give yourself great opportunity uh, to be successful. And then building it into a management system that if we look here and just thinking about all the different layers in an organization from the staff and supervisors, managers, directors, VPs, et cetera, having huddles, uh, the staff and supervisors huddling together every day, preparing, tracking metrics, fixing problems, those problems that can't get fixed in that huddle on the front lines get escalated through tiered huddles up to uh, as high in the organization as they need to go. Now, you don't need six steps here. You can, 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 it can go anywhere from the front line to a leadership huddle. You can have two or three steps in between, depending on what works in your organization. But the idea is that things that are serious, that something's happened at the front line that needs attention, it's getting that attention, however you structure that. There are safety huddles and staffing huddles and things like that that already happen in the organization. So those are great ways um, to uh, build on those to help approach this. And then from the leadership standpoint, having clarity, what's our mission and vision? Do we have a compact for our core values? Are they aligned with the True North metrics? Are we developing our strategy based on that? And how are we operationalizing that around dyad and triad leadership teams, around the working as coaches and mentors, around understanding our clinicians because we're shadowing them? Um, all of that creates connection back from the C-suite and leadership out to the front lines. So the front lines understand why they're doing what they're doing. The, the leaders understand what frustrations and problems the front lines are dealing with in the work that they're doing. When we build this into a virtuous cycle, we create incredible opportunity for improvement. Now, you've actually already done this. In the past year, with COVID, when this existential threat attacked the organization, suddenly you've changed faster than you thought you could. Part of the key to doing that was implementing a command center. Because with the command center, suddenly that process was happening every day, at, well, two or three times a day. When there was this existential threat, we needed to address things and take care of it immediately. And having a command center, you deploy in response to that, it proved that we're capable of changing and dealing with these VUCA environments. We never thought we could change this fast until we had no choice but to change this fast. Now we know. And we are still facing existential threats. When three to 400 physicians die from suicide each year, when you realize that all of the, the, the challenges of patient safety and other issues, there are existential threats. We need to be able to respond to all of these more, more proactively. I worry as I look around the country Almost every healthcare organization responded fantastically, creating command centers, solving problems real time, dealing with these issues. And then as COVID settled down, the meetings happened less. And some places have actually abandoned them altogether already. We're missing an amazing opportunity to drive change quickly. And to, you know, we think about your competitors. When you can address this and work effectively, you can create organizational resilience. 
not, not individual personal resilience to deal with burnout, organizational resilience. So that everyone is empowered and aligned as problem solvers in the world that they're dealing with. And then you can quickly adapt in that VUCA environment. You can address any problem that comes along when everyone is collectively working in this way. When you've got regular huddles, you've got great communication with leadership, people understand and work together in that process. And with that, well, you solve the core problem of survival, right? Because Darwin said it's not the smartest, the biggest, the, pers the, the healthcare organization with the best margin that survives. It's, it's those who can best adapt to change, best adapt to changes in their external environment. That is the key to survival. So by reducing burnout, by doing these things we talked about to reduce burnout, you actually drive uh, success in all of these metrics. And just to get a sense of how this can work in the five years as I led Sutter Gould, we had a call center. The average speed of answer was 30 to 40 seconds at first. We got it down to two seconds by using this type of work. We, we got the urgent care center. The labs that came out of the urgent care center got returned to the urgent care center within 20 minutes instead of 40 minutes because we got the two, two um, departments together and figured out how to do that better. And this was Kaiser Northern California. They reduced their wait times for MR and CT and ultrasound from 10 to 14 days down to one day. Imagine the difference that makes for doctors, for patients, when they're not waiting, not knowing what the results might be. Actually uh, drove great financial uh, results, had about an eight to one return on the investment. Um, we were able to grow our providers, um, uh, you know, by 50, uh, by 50 percent in that process. Um, our government charges got worse. Our payer mix deteriorated, but during that time, we actually were able to raise the salaries of our medical assistants from a subsistence wage to a living wage. And quite often, our medical assistants were the only wage earner in their family in their house. And we did that without increasing the salary cost per work RVU, because as we deployed lean across the entire organization, we found that there were many people doing things that we no longer needed them to do in registration, in billing, in, um, in just many different operations. And we could redeploy people into different, uh, into different roles, put them at the shoulder of the clinicians to support them. We didn't realize that um, Consumer Reports and this California Healthcare Performance Information System were evaluating all the medical groups in the state of California, but we got recognized as the top performer in the state two years in a row out of 170 groups. We were shocked when we first saw it. And we were, I don't know if we were more or less shocked the second year when we came out on top again. During that time, we went from 45th percentile to the 87th percentile in, in provider satisfaction on AMGA's provider satisfaction survey. It's a message that, yes, it does work. So that's all statistics. Here's the here's, you know, personal reality. Uh, this is uh, James Murphy. He works at the Cleveland Clinic. Well, actually, it's the Cleveland Clinic in Northeast Georgia Health System. It's a little three-provider clinic in the hamlet of Cleveland in Georgia. Uh, you'd almost miss it. You, you have trouble finding it on a map, but you'd certainly miss it if you blinked when you drove through town. But... He said we, you know, guided these types of changes in his clinic. And he was 35 years old. He told us he didn't think he could work for another five years at the rate things were going. With the changes that got made, they redesigned the change flow in their clinic. We helped them, guided them through these workflow redesigns, you know, that took a week off of work to get through, you know, to get the redesign done. Then daily huddles, getting them working effectively, creating standard work so everybody could work together identifying and solving problems. He said, wow, now that we've done this, this is great. I'm actually, I can work another two or three decades. I go home, I see my family, I take care of myself. The only thing I'm concerned about now is my salary's gonna have to go down. There's no way I'm as productive as I was before. We ran the numbers, he was actually 10% more productive. And we didn't add a single staff person to his office. So it didn't have to do with just adding more staff. Um, there are other ways you can do things like this that you know, perhaps could even help them be more productive. But the message is you can make a tremendous difference in everyone's lives as well as the health and resilience of the organization 
if everyone works together in this process. So my message to you, what should you do? Certainly learn about um, burnout and the more knowledge you have, the better. As a, and this is true both for physicians and for leaders. Uh, one thing for physicians or for leaders, getting the board of directors engaged in this work is important as well. Many people on boards, if you know board members, talk to them about burnout. Help them understand it. Because it, um, once you get the board members engaged, that just drives further engagement. Take care of yourself. In this process, you've got to take care of yourself. Self-care is not selfish. And it's a lesson that I've kind of struggled to learn. I think many of us get inculcated in this culture of medicine that we have to sacrifice in order to become as good as we possibly can and take care of people. We have to take care of ourselves as well. Build relationships and trust, and then uh, engage in Lean Done Right. There's a whole chapter in the book about Lean Done Right. It's, it's what we've been talking about here. It's empowering people who are doing the work uh, so that their ideas and knowledge can get put into place to make the difference. And as leaders, make, that, make your commitment visible to everyone. You do have to maintain an approach of both patience and urgency. And I don't know that I believe this slide as much as I used to, now that we've been through the pandemic and we did change quickly. Bill Gates has a saying, people overestimate how much you can accomplish in two years and underestimate how much you can accomplish in 10. I think we accomplished in less, in about three months, what we thought we could accomplish in five years when the, when the pandemic hit us. But the, this statement still, you know, if you're depending on, and I actually, so, before pandemic, I said it took us 10 years to dig, to dig our way into this mess. We can't expect it to go away in a year. But what's going to depend upon this is how quickly, how much you engage, how much the C-suite engages, not just in dollars, but in your own time and attention. And, and again, I think the pandemic has taught us a lesson. When we are faced with that threat, we can invest an incredible amount of time and attention and make change rapidly. Maybe we, don't, we can't survive under the stress levels of the heat of the pandemic surges uh, for long, but we can make these changes happen. And I do like to point out that you can really trust this advice because the two gentlemen on this slide have a combined net worth of about $100 billion. <laughs> so what's your role? Well, it's this is basically it. If you want things to get better, you're here in the Leadership Academy. You know this. You have to be part. You have to lead the change. You have to engage. The question is just how you're going to do that. So thank you so much. You're going to, you, it's your opportunity. You can make this place, you know, the place that uh, stands out as the best in the area, the best in the state, the best in the country, for sure. Thanks, all.